My name's Chad, one of the pastors here. It's a joy to be with you. We're in Luke's gospel. If you've got a copy of God's word, grab it, open it up. If it's on your device, you can also just follow along on screen, on the screen. I um, want to say hey to everybody online as well, or if it's in the future, the Bible time travels, so no problem there. Um, you'll be able to understand what's happening, and the Lord has something for you this morning. I do want to encourage you to get your own, and if you need one, in the back there you'll see a bunch of Bibles. Take one. Take it home. We won't accuse you of stealing. You're allowed. Um, we want you to have one. I do use the app Bible in One Year in the morning to show me where to be and to read the comments that Nikki Gumbel, a pastor in London, has about that day's passage. But I have my own Bible there. I like to write in it. I like to listen to the Lord. I like to ask questions and underline things and just, you know, I want to know what he's saying to me. And there's just something about having a book on your lap that's like, wow, this is real. I can touch these things, you know. So it's a good thing. I encourage you to do that. Um, have it in front of you so that you're looking at it, you're memorizing it. You will be shocked and surprised when the stuff hits the fan in your life. Verses start, will start coming out of your life. You'll start hearing the Lord speak to you, remind you of a verse. Does that to me all the time. So I want to pray for us as we jump in. Let's do it. Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you, God, that uh, it is uh, a story, Lord, this, this Bible, Lord, just talking with a couple of people in between services. This is one story about you, Lord. Uh, you said to the most religious and people who had memorized tons of the Bible, and you said, look, you're searching that book, but you're not finding what you want because you don't know that it's about me. Jesus, we're here to know you this morning. And God, we look around our world, we look at the things that are happening, and we can say at times, where are you? When will you fill in the blank? Uh, we can also say that we miss you. We long for you to come back, Lord. Uh, we believe in the return of the King, uh, but Lord, we, in the meantime, are waiting here. And so as we go to your word the same way that millions of people have for centuries to find hope, to find uh, your voice for this day. Lord, we pray that you would speak and God, that we would know you're speaking to us and that it is clear and a pinpoint message to the deepest needs of our heart. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in Luke chapter 18, verses 15 through 30. And I had a question as I started thinking about the, the topics that are in today's passages. Uh, and I asked this question, how old will I be in heaven? Uh, I know it's a weird question, but I've, you know, you've probably been around long enough to hear people that give these uh, near-death experiences and, oh, I saw so-and-so in heaven and it was my child who died when they were a baby. But when I met them, it was a grown person and they were strong and glowing, you know, all these different stories like that where we say, but I legitimately was like, how do you do that, Lord? Because we're going to have bodies and you may be like, what? Yeah, this body. What? <laughs> That is not how I understand things. It'll be renewed and perfect and restored, but it's going to be you. Like it's going to be, that's Chad. Yep. That's the Catholic. That's him. Like that's the one, that's the body he has. And so how does God decide those things? Is it important even? Because you are going to be you. What will people look like? And I think then it starts getting you to ask other questions like, well, how long is long enough to live to make a difference? To have had a life that's like, wow, that's really impactful. That's amazing. He did all these things and lived a full life. You ever heard that? Well, he lived a full life or it was cut short. And then you ask other questions like, what will people say about you, your life? You ever asked that question? You ever thought about that moment? If that it's a, you know, people are at a funeral and it's your funeral and you're not there. And they're saying things about you. What will they say? So this image, it's a screen grab from one of my favorite movies, Saving Private Ryan. It's 1998. I remember watching this and it's an older gentleman who is a veteran. He is walking down this long pathway in the American cemetery at Omaha Beach. I've been there. It is a very sacred, hallowed place. Um, those 
people, the French people who live in that area of France, you'll find things on their restaurants that say things like this, welcome to our liberators. It was not unusual to see a cross erected during World War II in France somewhere. They didn't know who the soldier was, an unknown soldier, but it would say this, died for France. And so a little different than if you go to Paris and they're like, Americans, rah. You know, like it's, there's a little different. You go to Normandy and there's just a, there's a different vibe and a different feel. They're like, yeah, we know what happened here. We got several thousand Americans and Canadians and yeah, they're all right there. So it's a sacred place. So this guy is walking in and it's clear that this is the first time he's been back since 1944. And there's a soberness to it. And his family is hanging back as he's walking. He's kind of walking like this and the cemetery's over there and he won't even look at it. He's just walking very slow. And all of a sudden he turns and he looks and it's like, you just see the tears in his eyes. He's glistening and the emotion and the weight. And he starts walking up to this spot somebody he knew. And first time he's really thought about this and what happened. And we're going to come back to this at the end, but I want to frame the beginning of this sermon with this because there's a phrase he says, and you can see them in the background. He says, my family's here with me. My family's here with me. And just think of all the time that has passed and his thoughts on his life, how What happened from then until this, from that moment until this moment? Life measured, what does a valued life look like? How old is old enough? What time do we have? Just, it got me thinking about a lot of these things. And Jesus is going to address these things today in our story. At least that's how he was speaking to me um, as I read this, and so this is obviously one sliver. I never try to give you everything. I try to jump in myself, let the Lord work on me. And then I even told this to Pastor Carl a few weeks ago. And then at the end of the week, I said, it's like I get in the car with Jesus on a passage and he drives and he's a crazy driver. We're like all over the place all week long. And the last part of the trip is Sunday morning where I open the door and I say, hey, PV, you guys want to get in for the last leg? That's how I approach this. I'm not trying to say everything, but I am trying to tell you how he hit me, what happened in my heart. So Luke 18, just to set up our story, verse 15. Now they were bringing even even infants. I love the way that's phrased. To him, to Jesus, that he might touch them. When the disciples saw it, they said, that's so great. Come on over. Jesus loves the little children. Uh Uh-uh. They rebuked them. Get away. No, no babies, no kids. Important things happening here. It's just stunning if you think about it. (laughs) It's stunning that they did that. But Jesus, like I could just see him like, no, 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 no. You guys, what are you doing? Bring them back, bring them back. But Jesus called them and said, no, let them come to me. Let the children come to me. Don't hinder them. What do you, get out of, get out of the way, Peter. Let Oh my goodness, get out of the way. Let that little one get over. Like that's, you got to picture what's happening. Like disciples are like bodyguards. Nope, sorry, little dude, can't touch him. You know, Jesus is like, get out of the way. Let them come to me. And then he says something stunning. He says, actually, you see that little boy right there? You see that little baby? The kingdom of God belongs to them, to people like them. Truly, I say to you, whenever Jesus says truly or truly, truly, you're supposed to go, oh, 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 okay, okay, wait, what? He's he's trying to like that. Verily, verily, truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Interesting. Children were not valued in this culture. They were considered necessary, but stay out. Adults are doing important things here. Grownups valued grownups. And wanted to talk about grown-up things. And so, but either way though, people, and I think moms, are bringing their infants and babies to Jesus. You know it was the moms. They're like, get out of my way. I am taking him to Jesus. My kid, you, I don't care. I'm taking my baby up there. I want him to touch my baby. I want him to say something. Our moms know this. My mom knew this. My mom knew this and kept pushing me into Jesus. 
into his presence, praying for me, even to the point when I was a senior in high school and I was at that moment when I was like, listen here, I'm old now and I know how to do things and you don't, I'm, I'm gonna leave soon. You don't need to tell me how to do things anymore. And I had done something that she disagreed with. Well, I disagreed with her. And I was like, I'm not going to apologize for that. I think it was fine. She knew she had a, a card she could play. And it was the Jesus card through my youth pastor. She goes, well, why don't you go ask Tim? I was like, no, no, <laughs> that is not fair. <laughs> She knew if it failed with her that I could, if I went to Tim, Tim would back her up and he would say, hey, yeah, your mom's right, buddy. You need, to, you need to own that. And so she, that was her way of pushing, getting, get out of the way. I got to bring Chad to Jesus. And I think she's still doing it. She's still praying for me. But you know, the moms were doing this. And there's this other part too, though. Jesus was a kid magnet. It wasn't our artwork most of the artwork throughout church history does not communicate this. What does the artwork from church history communicate? Come to Jesus. Right? It's, it's really stoic and serious. I remember my grandmother had one of those pictures of Jesus that you just terrified of. So the dark eyes, beard, and you're like, okay, I don't want it. He's looking at me. Like, that's how it feels. Kids knew he was awesome. They knew he was, they, I want you to picture like kids knew, they were like running through his legs, figure eight, chasing each other. He's swinging them around. They, Jesus was a magnet, but the disciples are so grown up. They think this is a nuisance. They want to hear Jesus teach. They want to watch him do miracles. So when all this stuff starts happening, they're upset and they're rebuking the kids. It's so dumb. But Jesus invites them in anyway. Let them come to me. And that, as I said, that astonishing statement where he connects their hearts, receive the kingdom of God like a child, or you will not enter it. What does that even mean? What does that even mean? How old will I be in heaven? When was the last time you saw a grown-up who made a decision for Jesus, do it in a way that was like, wow, that guy's just like a kid, the way he's responding. He's just so joyful, so simple. Nobody had to twist his arm. He was just like, yes, I'll follow. We don't do that anymore. In fact, in the church, we're so used to people not doing that, that we think it's going to take years. It's going to take, you're, you're going to have to have your logic Apologetics, which is a fancy word for saying, you know how to kind of debate and talk about the arguments for the existence of God and all these kinds of, like you can go toe to toe with somebody who wants to debate whether or not there is a God and why you should follow him. You better have that ready. You better have your logic. You better be ready to pray for people for like 25 years because nobody is going to respond to Jesus. Everybody's too grown up for it. Everybody's too old. Everybody's so smart, has tons of information. Is that like my... I'm done. <laughs> I'm just messing with you, Jack. But that's pretty funny, though. This is a good one. Um, everybody can own everybody else. Think about it. What we do online. Somebody says something. Everybody's like, no. Point, counterpoint, punch. I disown you. I don't even want to talk to you ever again. You're not even a human being. So we accept this long, grueling process of people coming to Jesus. Nobody comes like a child. Everybody comes grown up. We're all adults. Even our children are adults now. They got all the information they need. You present truth. They're like, well, I got five stories here and videos and websites to say, mom, you're wrong. I've, I've, I'm grown up. I know what things are. I know what's real, what's true. Nothing's new, nothing's novel. Everyone's been there, done that, has an answer for everything and everyone. I am an adult and I'm too old for all this Jesus stuff. It's kind of what our world is like. But Jesus puts it there as, yeah, but you, you need to be a child. No, I need to make something of myself. I need to live a valuable life, something that counts. I don't have time to be childlike in my faith. And it is to this heart attitude that Jesus speaks about being a kid, about being innocent and playful and joyful and loving repetition. 
loving repetition. Do you know what I'm talking about? When your kids are like, you show something fun, and what do they say? Again, 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 again. One more time, you're like, no, it's time to play Frozen Man. (laughs) I'm gonna lay super still on the couch, and you lay super still on that couch, and let's see how long we can do it. (laughs) Let's do that again. Because they, they never tire. They're always ready. Do you remember being flung around helicopter by your dad holding arms? We were doing that with our kids and now we got adults telling us, don't do that, you're gonna rip their arms out of their sockets. (laughs) Thanks a lot, adult. You ruined one of the greatest games ever. Like so much so that I was like, I remember swinging around our kids and I'd be like, I better offer some like extra support and grab them like further down, like up on their torso or something so I don't rip their arms out. You know what's gonna happen, some kid in Arizona, his dad ripped out his arms, swinging him around, playing helicopter. (laughs) Thank you adults for being so adults and helping us. I remember being in the pool and I was totally frightened of the deep end. The pool was scary, but do you remember doing this? I remember my dad saying, you wanna ride on my back? I can recall the smell of English leather cologne dissipating in the water as my dad got in the water, the freckles on his back and grabbing around his neck in this floating sensation as he swam through the water and him saying, are you ready? Yep. For what? We're going deep. And you know, you go deep and you hold your breath and you're like kind of pushing your arms up like this. I remember that. It was safe. It was this trust that we had. Wasn't trying to like talk myself out of it. It was like, it's my dad. I can remember getting out of the pool. And if you look at your hands right now, you can probably remember when they were little and they were prune-like because you'd been in the pool for hours. And you're standing there with a towel wrapped around you that your mom brought to you. And you're shivering like this and you have goggle marks on your eyes and your hair's pulled back from the goggles that are still stuck on your head. And you're like, can we get back in the pool, please? Because we never tire. Chad, how in the world does this connect with what Jesus said about being childlike? G.K. Chesterton is the theologian. He wrote this. You should see it on the screen there. Because children have abounding vitality because they are in spirit fierce and free. Therefore, they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exalt in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exalt in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately has never got tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy. And here it is. For we have sinned and grown old and our father is younger than we. Simple question. Is your heavenly father younger than you are? I think it's a little bit of going to what Jesus is saying. Have we grown old? Has this become too old hat for us. You know, I'm not sure who the eyewitness account for this story about the kid was for Luke, but let's not forget the gospel of Luke was a group of stories put together for a friend named Theophilus. Luke was a doctor and he said, all right, Holy Spirit, help me arrange these accounts. And he was sitting down with eyewitnesses, people that were there and they're like, oh man, yeah, this one day, Jesus was, was trying to teach and these kids were like running through him like crazy and hanging on him and he's trying to teach stuff. There's people upset and he's like, okay, let me get that down. And then somebody else says, oh, I, I've heard this story too. So as he puts this story together and last week we had the Pharisee who's praying all, I'm so great, that tax collector's awful. And then Luke gets to this part and he knows he wants to get to the next story, which we're gonna get to, but the Holy Spirit says, wait, wait. Put in these three sentences about the kids. Right here, right here, right here. 
Yeah, right here. It's important. It's important to put this childlike faith thing from Jesus right here before we get to a very grown up person, an adult who has done with childlike anything. And he comes in verse 18. A ruler asked him, good teacher. And you got to read it that way because this guy's pouring on the schmooze. Okay. He's not trying to be nice. He's not trying to be authentic. He is schmoozing. Good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. The guy thought about it. He said, hmm. Well, all these I've kept from my youth. So he's a ruler. He's rich. The other gospels let us know he was young. He has life figured out. He's all grown up. It works for him. He's mastered it. He has wanted to master something and he just puts his mind to it. He puts his money to it. There are no worries or fears in his life that he hasn't controlled or conquered with money and know-how and a little bit of schmooze. That's what he does. He's, a, he's an adult, yet something is eating at him. Something's bothering him. He's standing there watching Jesus with these kids and something's bothering him. And he needs to ask him something, but he's watching these kids like run in and out and hang on him. And he's like, excuse me, excuse me. Kids are like, ha, 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 running, hanging on. Rabbi, everybody's like, whoa, okay. Dude, what do you want to say? I, listen, I got things to do. I got people to see. I got properties and people to oversee. Can you stop hanging out with kids for a minute? I want to ask you an important question, an adult question. You know, maybe he heard Jesus say that statement about childlike faith and having to receive the kingdom like a child. And I picture him, I try to see people. I've told you guys to do this. Whenever you read God's word, you want to find yourself in the story. Where are you standing? How do you see people? And so I see this ruler standing there like this. He's kind of like tapping his foot. He's just upset and he's angry. And he kind of has this like, scoffing look and his lips are pursed in a way because they're about to go <sighs> you ever do that where you just you're you're just ready to scoff at things here's Jesus say this thing like children and I can just hear it under his breath <sighs> like children give me a break he's going to get this rabbi back into rabbi mode quit playing around so he does the good teacher gotten me far in life. I know how to schmooze people. I know how to address people when I want to get something. I've learned that old saying of you attract more flies with honey than vinegar. So I'm going to try a little honey here. I'm going to ask him and use my title and the words and kind words. I'm going to butter him up to see if I can get what I need to get from Jesus. But the honey doesn't mask the seriousness of his question though. And it's a big one. He lacks something. He feels this ache. Maybe you feel it too. This loss. He has everything, yet he's missing something. And Jesus sees right through the flattery and says, why do you call me good? Because every Jew knew, just read the Old Testament. It was basic stuff to know there's no one good but God. Now, technically he's correct. This is Jesus. This is the son of God. He's good, but he doesn't know that. He doesn't know that. So Jesus calls out the flattery. Jesus calls out the schmoozing. Jesus says, look, I'm not doing small talk with you. Jesus doesn't do small talk. He does big talk. He wants to do real authentic stuff. So don't bring pretense to him. Come to him authentically. And he says, he's, he's right on the topic though, eternal life. That's huge. It's a big question. It's one we should be asking about. It's one that people less and less are asking. Now, remember the phrase from enter the kingdom to be like a child. You have to receive the kingdom of God to enter the kingdom. Now interchange it with inherit eternal life. Same concept, same phrase. The guy's just asking it as an adult. It's the same thing. What can I do to enter the kingdom? How can I get there? But he says, how can I, what to inherit? 
It already tells you a little bit of how his mind works. And here is his swing for the fence moment. I am throwing everything I have into this question. What must I do? What must I do? If there are sound effects at this point, like game show sound effects, eh, that's what you'd hear. Wrong question, but we want to do subtext, which means there's things going on behind the scenes. And I want you just to pause for a minute and think about Jesus looking at this guy. I imagine an awkward pause because Jesus, I'm sure he just didn't respond right away. Jesus sees our whole life. Think about the Psalms. Surely I knit you together in your mother's womb. Every day of your life, is, is it not written down in my book? I know you. So imagine Jesus guy asked the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus goes through his whole life in a matter of seconds in his head. Like you have the mind of Jesus. He's going, the son of God, and he's looking every day in this guy's life, every try hard moment, every successful moment, every lonely place that the guy filled up with more stuff, every rejection, every disappointment of life where he pushed away those feelings. Just give me more stuff. Give me more money. I can do this. I'm in control. And if we could hear the son of God's thoughts, his mind, which by the way, the New Testament tells you, if you know Jesus, you have the mind of Christ. How cool is that? Here's what we hear. Your problem is you still think this is something you can do. You think this is something you can do. It's not in your control. That's what he's saying to the rich young ruler. It's not in your control. You can't spend enough. You can't earn enough. So Jesus begins with a famous list of do nots, the commands. You know the commands. What's he doing? I stole this from my youth pastor. I listened to him. I've told you guys how Tim is uh, already face to face with Jesus. So I love listening to his voice. He was talking about this and he said, Jesus at this moment is holding a thermometer in his hand, like a great physician. And what happens when you go to urgent care or the doctor or ER? What's the first thing they do for any of us? Even if you like, you're in like crazy pain, they take your temperature, they check your blood pressure, they ask you a bunch of questions. Jesus holds out the thermometer and says, let's see if you have a fever. Because God's commands are God's way of saying, this is 98.6 for your soul. Here's what my standard is. Here's what your soul functions well on. Let's see if you have a fever. You know, fevers are a big thing. Fevers indicate other things are going on. If you were here over a year ago and I got up here to preach and I had a fever, and if you remember that, I ended up on that row right there laying down with every nurse and doctor in the church looking at me like this. And them saying, we need to call the paramedics to come. I was like, no, please don't do that. They had me back there. I was, please don't. They're like, why don't you let us do our job? We know how to do this. They came anyway. They're like taking off my shirt. I'm like, this is the most uncomfortable thing, but I had a fever. There were other things going on that needed to be found out. As my youth pastor said, when Jesus put the thermometer, spiritually speaking, in the guy's mouth, pulled it out, looked at it and said, you're sick. And he said this, and I'll say it just because it's kind of fun. You have affluenza. It says the only culturally and socially acceptable disease and sickness that we're all okay with in America. We're good. Yep. Affluenza. Uh, let's talk about something more important. But there's more than that. More than just his stuff. He's sick. But you know what he said? As he's standing there sweating, a bit pale, as my mom say, would say, he looks peaked. <laughs> he doesn't look right. It's kind of wobbling a little bit. He said, no, uh, <coughs> I'm good. All these I have kept since I was a boy. You know what he should have said? Oh, Jesus, I've been breaking these my whole life. All of them. Because as Jesus raised the bar, remember we talked about this? He didn't just say it's murder. What did he dial it back to? Hatred it isn't just adultery, it's did you look lustfully? I feel fine. So, how does Jesus respond? Verse 22 Jesus heard this, he said to him, Okay, 
One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. When he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Woo. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. If you ask me, what are you worried about? And I would say, hmm, let me see, let me think about it. For, no, I don't have to think about it at all. Money. I don't think about it at all. Money. Will I have enough to provide? Will there be enough? Will there be enough for our staff to continue to work? All that, like it's instant. We get this part of him, don't we? We get this sense of control. Our, our lives revolve around these things. I remember working for my grandmother when I was young. I pulled weeds, I mowed the lawn, I moved some stuff for her. I was a little boy, so I didn't understand the whole thing of working and money, but she came, she goes, well, I wanna pay you. I was like, oh, okay. And I remember she pulled out her little pocketbook, she called it a pocketbook, pulled out her wallet, opened it up and started thumbing through and pulling out $1 bills. And I was like, wide-eyed, like, this is awesome. She gave me $8. I thought I was the richest kid in the world. I found an old book at my house. I took scissors and I cut out the size of a dollar bill in the middle because I thought that was cool. I need a secret place to hide my money. I put the ones in there, closed it up, put the book on my shelf, you know, like looking over my shoulder, to see if anybody's looking. I would go into my room, I'm like 11, and I would get that book out and I would take out those dollars and I'd go one, two. I would count it and get to eight and I'd be like, stack it back up. I'm like, wow, I'm so rich. <laughs> we get this draw to money. It makes complete sense in our world. We have to have it. We never have enough. We order our lives around getting more. It's the easiest thing to get in the way of following Jesus, isn't it? For sure. But don't make the mistake of thinking that having it or being rich is sinful. That is not what Jesus is saying. So what is happening? Something not said here, and I love this, but understood from the other gospels, the other accounts of Jesus, and give us context. They were keyed in on something huge that was happening. More subtext, what's happening. If you had a behind the scenes film of the gospels, one of the other gospels gives a verse that's like, ooh, I didn't know that was happening. And here's what they said was happening at this moment. Jesus is looking at this guy. This guy's like, I'm fine. He's coughing. He's barely standing up. Jesus is saying, hey, you lack this. Go sell everything you have. And I love it because it says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Even in that moment of not saying the right things, not thinking the right, not being where he needs to be, Jesus looked at him and loved him and spoke hard truth. So you're feeling okay. Fit as a fiddle, huh? Okay, let's go for a run. What if you had a doctor do that? Knows you're sick, you're like, I feel fine. You're coughing, you're barely standing up. Like, let's go for a run. In fact, let's go for a long run. In fact, let's run a marathon, 26.2 miles. We're gonna aim for just under a nine minute mile pace, which will have us finishing just under four hours. That's a good marathon. Let's go run a marathon. Go sell everything you have and distribute it to the poor. Jesus wasn't trying to set this standard to say everybody must take a vow of poverty. What he was trying to do was get to the guy's heart. He's a great physician. And so he held up the thermometer and then he continued to triage and diagnose and get to the core of things so that the guy would finally realize what is wrong with me? Well, this is my idol. What do I lack? Everything. How much more do I need? So much that you cannot count it. It's our hearts and money. So what are some practical applications? Because Jesus is talking about money. What do we do with that? One thing you will never hear from Pleasant Valley is one, us tell you, you have to give here. You will actually hear me sometimes say, if you're committed to another church, give there, please. Please continue until the Lord leads you. You'll never hear me tell you how much you should give. 
You may be like, wait a minute, what about the tithe, the tithe, the 10% thing? Yeah, that's a starting place in the scripture. But what does the scripture say? It continues to unfold it. And it says this, each person should decide in his heart. It's between you and Jesus. It's between you and Jesus, not between you and you. Many of us don't have that conversation though. That's all we ask, have the conversation with the Lord. But this is about so much more. And I'll say this too, like we're counting on you having that conversation. We don't exist. We don't do what we do here unless you guys do. I think most people know that, but if you didn't know that, thank you for having the conversation with the Lord and for listening and keep doing that. Keep, keep trusting him with your finances. But this is more than just money. Jesus knows how to handle our hearts as a great physician. And so he puts in front of him with this phrase, and you will have treasure in heaven. So much more valuable than anything you can have here. This is this guy's idols though. He has control over it. He's self-made and Jesus is asking him to give it up. Now, some may say this whole thing of the camel and the eye of the needle, there's a cool story that there was a needle gate in Jerusalem and that camels had to get on their knees and take off all their stuff to get through. It's not true. Okay. It's a nice little story. It's not true. It was just a parable. It was this hyperbole that was used back then in the Middle East. It was a camel. It was an elephant through the eye of a needle in Israel. It was a camel because that was their biggest animal. And he's saying it's difficult, but it's not impossible. Difficult, but not impossible. Why is it difficult? It's because you can't earn it. You cannot do enough to earn heaven, to earn entrance into the kingdom of God. When you have a lot, when you're used to making things happen with your money or your personality or your schmoozing, then you think I can do this. No, just give me chance, give me time and I'll do enough good things. And we talked about last week, we'll get to the end and my scale will be tipping towards the good side. Everything will be good. Jesus says, you can't, you cannot do enough. And this part, the man didn't just become sad. The other gospels tell us he did something else. He's talking to Jesus. Jesus says this and you know what he did? He left. He walked away. Like everything stops. The guy is gone. And the disciples are freaking out a little bit because they're not necessarily all poor. They came from businesses. Some of them do, you know, Matthew, just, they all had stuff. Lord, who can even be saved? This is impossible because we all struggle with this. And then this phrase, if there ever was a gospel statement that you can take to the bank, the spiritual bank, this is it. What is impossible with man is possible with God. No, you can't do enough to get there, but Jesus can and has. The question is whether or not you'll surrender, which is why he says, surrender and follow me. So we finish with three verses. I love Peter. It's probably my favorite because he's brash. He's bold. And here's what he says. Verse 28, Peter said, well, we did right? Like, yeah, I kind of hear like almost like a question. We, we left homes and followed you, right? right? Are, are, are we in? Jesus said, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come. See, we have left our homes and followed you. Lord, I think maybe I'm, I'm that camel you were talking about. I think, did I? I mean, have I? I think I, I, think I have passed through, because Peter had a job. Peter had a business, fishing business. Left it to follow Jesus. Did I pass through the eye of the needle? Was the impossible possible through you, Jesus? And Jesus looks at him and says, indeed, you have. You have. And then whenever Jesus connects what you're doing Monday through Saturday with eternity, you should listen up. What does he say? In this time and in the age to come. In this time and in the age to come. He does not say, yeah, that's then. This is now, just live for now. He says they're connected. <coughs> when Jesus frames it this way, we should be 
listening. Our hearts should be burning. So I want to finish just by telling you about um, just a couple of things. One, a song that I've been listening to the last couple of weeks, this week in particular. It's been, a, it's been hard. It's been a hard couple of weeks. Um, I felt very um, broken down and beat up and burned down and burned up and just fumes like, and I know it's true. And so I go to my wife and I'll say, tell me what's true again, but just hard, difficult. I know to go to him. I know to seek him. I know to not take things on my shoulder that I shouldn't, but there's a song and the title is no one ever cared for me like Jesus. And I just want to read a couple of the lyrics to you. His faithful hand has held me all this way, all this way. And when I'm old and gray and all my days are numbered on the earth, let it be known in you alone, my joy is found. And one other line in that song that I want to be true for me, as I think about my family, I think about my own children, here it is. May my children tell their children that Jesus was everything to me. May that be the lasting thing that is said. Jesus was everything. Now look at this image, Saving Private Ryan. It's a different one. Now, 1998, so I'm going to spoil the movie for you. Sorry. If you haven't been watching it by now. Okay, so this is, uh, that's the guy, the old guy, but it's Matt Damon, the younger version of himself. Uh, Tom Hanks plays Captain Miller. And he's remembering back to this moment in the cemetery. And he leans down to that. And what is he looking at in the cemetery? It's a cross. Just vivid for me as I thought about this. And here's what he says, as I began at the beginning, I'm here with my family. Every day of my life, I think about what you said on that bridge. I've tried to live my life the best I could. I hope that was enough. What did he say on that bridge? Had him lean in. All these guys have been killed trying to get him out, saving Private Ryan. He's Private Ryan. He leans in, leans in. Tom Hanks pulls him close. And in his final breath of life says this, earn this earn this, which prompts him at near the end of his life with his family wondering, did I do enough? I've thought about those words every day. I've tried to live the best I could. I hope that was enough. It's powerful, isn't it? Powerful just to think about, hey, I want to <clears throat> live life to the full. I want to do everything I can. But here is the difference with the gospel. The gospel does not say earn, earn this. Jesus does not say, earn this. He says, no, be a kid. <laughs> be a child. Surrender to me. You can't earn it. I've done it for you. I've accomplished this for you. Give up your world. Give up your love for the world. Follow me. All hope. Another song that I sing all the time. All my hope is in Jesus. All my hope is in Jesus. So back to reflecting on the value of life. My kids, your kids, this is hypothetical because I'm still here. But one day, if mine are asked, hey, Caleb, Abigail, Maya, what about your dad? My dad? This is what I hope. You know what? He, he lost his life for Jesus. He treasured Christ. When it came to Jesus, he was such a kid. Simple, beautiful, unwavering confidence, trust, hope in the cross, the resurrection, the ascension, the return of Jesus. Jesus was everything. Our dad, when it came to his resources, his time, his gifts, his whole person, he was ready to spend it all on Jesus. Every dime, every moment, every breath. Now I'm working on that even hearing my own words that I can't earn it, look to Christ who has accomplished it already, which is the way it will be said of you one day, hopefully. Same. Their hope was in Christ. What will they say about you? Let's pray. Oh Lord, we...
love how you, your word is this deep well of living water. Lord, I love how I can hear a story that I've heard a hundred times and you can take me down this crazy path in your car, um, showing me some things about myself, showing me some things about myself the last few weeks of trying to be an adult <laughs> and not being childlike in my trust of who you are. And so Lord, I know this morning, um, this is how the Holy Spirit works. And I just encourage you all, if you're listening, he's talking to you this morning. It could be as simple as him saying to you, this is the moment, this is the time. Leave it, leave it right where it is, follow him. Admit your deep need that you're sick. Lord, I have a fever. I'm sick without you, I'm lost without you. But it also could be that Jesus is very much pinpointing this morning for us a specific area of our life. Could be money, could be our trust and our abilities, could be a secret sin that we have just continued to say, I can handle it, I can handle it, I can handle it, and it's killing you, it's killing you. Jesus says, be a kid this morning. Be childlike in the way you view me. Realize true value. True value is the treasure that is Jesus, that he is the pearl of great price. He is the one that we sell everything else and we buy a field to hide that pearl. Oh Lord, we love you. We thank you for your grace that speaks and moves and your spirit that is ever present and persistent, uh, resilient, Lord, even to our um, trying to push you away. Would you come after us hard? And uh, Lord, I am thankful for what your word says that we can stand one day at the end of our life and say, did it matter? Did my life matter? And that Jesus, if you are the center, if you, uh, your record is on mine, covering me, literally almost like a dad pulling their child behind his legs in safety. Well, that's what you do for us. And so, um, God, we need your blessing. We know that blessing comes through Jesus. I pray we would receive it this morning in worship. Amen. Why don't we stand together and sing?